university. I'm not going to say anything very complex. I'm going to just talk a bit about how should we think about inequality in the context of the post-2015 discussions about development goals. So I'm going to steer us back to that topic that uh, Rebecca started with. Um, and it's, I'm going to be a little bit um, philosophical about this, but I think there's something missing here. And I'm certainly not going to talk about how best to measure inequality, because I don't think that's the point at all. Um, Rebecca said, told us about how the, diffi the difficulties that the uh, UN high-level panel has had in agreeing on um, any kind of inequality reduction goal. Um, and on reflection, that's not at all surprising. I'm not in the least bit surprised that they had a, little, a lot of difficulty with that agreement. And I don't think it's a simple matter of political economy or ideology even. Uh, inequality is just not like poverty or infant mortality. Poverty, we want to go to zero. That's a view we have now. Actually, 200 years ago, we didn't think that. But today, there's a consensus around that. Infant mortality, we want it to go to zero. There is absolutely no reason we want inequality to go to zero. Inequality can be too high and it can be too low from the point of view of our development goals. And neither philosophy nor economics gives us any mandate or any argument that for unqualified, of unqualified emphasis or support for the idea of just unambiguously reducing inequality. It's a, far, a very much more nuanced argument. Uh, if you think about uh, Jeremy Bentham and the utilitarians, um, uh, many people following Bentham, but uh, leave that aside, they created a, a, a beautiful, conceptually beautiful case for believing that in a very qualified way that inequality of incomes was undesirable under certain conditions amongst homogeneous people. Heterogeneity in needs would change that dramatically, but it was inequality in incomes, it wasn't inequality of utility, and it was a very qualified case. And it certainly didn't say that inequality could just go to zero if the mean was going to change as well. That brings in the whole, all the debates about incentives. I think incentive arguments are exploited by the right and overemphasized greatly in discussions about policy, but at your peril, ignore incentives. Do not ignore incentives. The, the, uh, that, uh, the arguments against uh, the idea of a society with virtually zero inequality or forcing inequality too low, the incentive arguments are compelling. I don't think they're compelling about a lot of the ways in which they're used in discussing social policy these days, but don't ignore them. Um, the other argument, that you can, the other brand of philosophy, if you like, that we can draw on is, is the contractarian approach, John Rawls, and so on. Now, here again, the arguments, the, the, the sort of libertarian arguments, are, are very nuanced. I mean, John Rawls is absolutely happy with inequality as long as it benefits the poor. His focus is very much inequality is fine. It has to, that's the diff, what he called the difference principle or maximin. Inequality is acceptable as long as poor people benefit. It's unacceptable if it hurts poor people. And I, I'm very sympathetic with that. I'm certainly actually not a utilitarian. I'm much more a Rawlsian. Uh, in recent times, we've got John Roman. We've got a series of philosophers, including very prominent philosophers on the left, uh, Jerry Cohen, for example. Um, who have come up with, a, with another argument about inequality, which essentially says that uh, inequality, of circ inequality stemming from unequal circumstances is undesirable, but inequality stemming from effort is something we shouldn't care about. So again, a very qualified view. Um, that's led to a, a, an agenda for equality of opportunity, which I think is very important, and, and Rebecca mentioned this. This is actually the space. So inequality, put it this way, inequality fails the consensus test. Inequality of outcomes. Very clearly, we are not, it's not imaginable we could get a consensus for good reasons that inequality of outcomes is, is unambiguously undesirable. All right? We could get that consensus with equality of opportunity, and I think it's, it's not far from, from reach. But I want to sort of put a bit of a wet blanket on that as well. I mean, just to, to, to make sure we're not buying something, buying more than we want. Um, I think we can reach agreement, but there are also some issues. I find it absolutely unimaginable, if I think about it, any civilized society would ignore inequalities, extreme deprivations that stem from mistakes that people made, bad choices. I, I think it would always be inhumane. If you can imagine that such a society, a society which only redressed or only addressed inequalities opportunity, inequalities stemming from unequal, from disadvantages of birth, disadvantages of circumstances, caste, race, where you're born, and so on. Enormously important 
that no society could ever ignore inequalities of outcomes. Uh, and I think that was echoed earlier on. There's also a deep identification problem that, that is just getting ignored too much, I believe, in the discussions of inequality of opportunity. And this, I think, is something that I hopefully will come up in continuing discussions about development goals. Um, that's about behaviour. Behaviour in, in, inevitably intervenes between circumstances and outcomes. And there's no way of getting around that. That means that circumstances, they influence behaviours, they rarely dictate um, outcomes. Circumstances are things which interact with behaviours to determine the outcomes we see in the, in the world around us. That means that there's always scope for individual responsibility. Anything we see, any outcomes we see, we can see and it, something due to circumstances and we can see something due to individual responsibility. The logic of opportunity egalitarianism can thus slip very easily into blaming poor people for their poverty and excusing rich people for, this, for their success on the grounds of some claimed effort they have made. And we actually see this repeating. It's one of the reasons, unfortunately, one of the reasons why we have an emerging consensus around inequality of opportunity on both the left and the right. The right can be very happy to advocate anti-opportunity egalitarianism because they can see all kinds of efforts that explain their, their why they're in the top, why, why some of them, for example, are in the top 1%. Uh, you can make the arguments, and, and you're going to have those arguments, and that, that, that if, if we are going to achieve that consensus around inequality opportunity, that's going to be, that's going to be happening. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of a qualified view on that, but I want to just uh, finally point to a couple of things. Even if we agree, suppose we can get to a point on equality of opportunity as the goal. Two further conditions need to be established before we, we, we go ahead with thinking of that in, 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 in the context of our development goals. And neither of these conditions has actually been established, neither, and neither of them being discussed. And that's the weirdest thing here, and I haven't heard it mentioned today. Two conditions. First, we need to establish that existing goals put too little weight on inequality. I haven't heard any mention of that. We have a whole bunch of MDGs, and very rightly, the high-level panel is, is respecting them, and we should move ahead on them. But please show me, how are they underweighting inequality? Every one of the MDGs depends on inequality. It's not independent. Distribution influences our progress against poverty. It influences our progress in health and education. Every single one of the MDGs, I would argue, is accountable in part to inequality. So what we have to ask ourselves is, how are the MDGs underweighting inequality? And we have to be very specific about that. If we're going to put up a new inequality agenda, we've got to be very clear on what it is that the existing MDGs are missing. Second condition, we have to establish that to correct that thing that's missing, the best thing to do it is an inequality measure. Logically, we've got to have two conditions. We've got to establish that inequality is missing from the existing goals. And secondly, we've got to establish that the solution, the correction, is to add an inequality measure. That's not obvious at all. So, going back to poverty, one of my favourite topics. Um, OK, I, I'm fully accept now. I didn't uh, 10 years ago, but now I'm fully accept on the basis of the research that's happened that absolute inequality measures put too little weight on an important aspect of distribution to do with social inclusion, to do with your, 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 your ability to participate in the society around you, at the society around you. There's a relativist concept in inequality that I think is valid. And, I, and I've learnt that from the research, not, certainly not just my own, research in many disciplines as well. So I'm willing to accept that. That means that I can identify something in an absolute poverty measure that is missing and it's about inequality. What's the solution? It's not to add an inequality measure, it's to measure relative poverty better. And I would argue, in fact, our poverty MDGs, a really good positive step would be keep the absolute poverty agenda, focus on poverty by an international standard, but also by the standards of the country or the society in which you live in, and keep both hand in hand. That's the solution, not to add an equality measure. So in conclusion, just two, point, two points, and I think just to reiterate, reiterate them. Um, high inequality can, can slow progress against development. I have no doubt about that. Low inequality can also slow progress against uh, progress toward our development goals. No doubt about that either. Uh, but that does not constitute a case for adding an equality measure on its own as a, as a goal in itself. If you don't, if I'm not convinced you so far, let's make another argument. Okay, 
Growth. GDP, old-fashioned GDP growth, does not is not one of the MDGs. It looks like it's missing too. Should we add that? If you think that you should add inequality to the existing MDGs, surely, logically, you've got to argue, well, I've got to add growth too. We're not going to do that. That would be a step backwards. And secondly, even if we do agree, we've got to think very carefully about why inequality is undervalued and how what we do to change that. Thank you.